Welcome back to Movie Rewind. Today I will recap for you a crime, drama, thriller movie from 2002 titled John Q. Spoilers ahead, watch out, and take care. As the movie begins, we see a young woman driving her BMW on a rural freeway. She plays her music loudly and accelerates past several other drivers. As she goes to pass a semi-truck, another one clips her bumper, spinning her into the truck's path. The driver has no opportunity to take evasive measures and runs her car off the road. Several weeks earlier in Chicago, John Quincy Archibald is a blue-collar factory worker trying to make ends meet for his family. He is quick to cover any of his co-workers' shifts as his company recently cut back his hours. Even so, he falls behind on his bills, and the bank comes early one morning to repossess his wife's car. John drops his wife, Denise, off at her job as a waitress, and his son, Michael, off at school. Michael, an aspiring bodybuilder, gives his father one of his signature poses before bidding him farewell. Later that day, John looks for a second job to help earn enough to get Denise's car back. He finds an attractive position and goes to apply. The interview room is full of applicants, for only a few available positions, and the hiring manager, though impressed by John's experience, ultimately says that he is overqualified. The next day, John and Denise are at Michael's Little League game, when he suddenly collapses on the base path. They rush Michael to the emergency room and notify the doctor that he has stopped breathing. Although they were able to stabilize his condition, the staff warns that Michael remains in critical condition. John and Denise then meet with the hospital director, Rebecca, and the head cardiologist, Dr. Turner. Dr. Turner explains that Michael's heart is damaged beyond the point of corrective surgery. His only hope of survival is a heart transplant, otherwise he has a very short timetable, one month at the most. Rebecca then notes that they have already checked with John's insurance policy, and it does not cover heart transplants as they are classified as an elective procedure. Because Denise doesn't receive medical insurance at her job, the hospital is forced to treat Michael as a cash account. The procedure costs roughly $250,000, and they require a 30% deposit before Michael can be placed on the receiver's list. John assures her that it must be a mistake, as he has been with the same company for 20 years, but she can only recommend he file an appeal with the carrier. John and Denise spend the coming days exhausting every option they can think of. Denise picks up extra shifts at her job, they hold a yard sale to sell any unused items or appliances, and John receives donations from their church. John files an appeal with the insurance carrier, but his company's HR department says that his benefits were changed when his hours were reduced. Even after selling Denise's engagement ring, they are well short of the $75,000 deposit. One morning, Denise calls John from the hospital and reports that Michael's condition is worsening. Hysterical, she says if they don't do something immediately, Michael is going to die. John goes to see Dr. Turner and pleads with him to at least add Michael to the recipient list while he works on the deposit. Dr. Turner says that his hands are tied, so John takes over the emergency room by force. He holds a gun to Dr. Turner's chest, and places chains on all the exit doors. The security guard, Max, locks out the elevators, while John disables the surveillance cameras. Soon after, an ambulance arrives with a gunshot victim and finds the doors locked. John tries to send them to another hospital, but the patient is in critical condition, so he allows one of the nurses, Steve, to admit him. He is immediately taken to one of the operating rooms where they discover that the wound requires immediate surgery, forcing Dr. Turner to operate on him despite being a cardiac specialist. Dr. Turner finishes in surgery, successfully saving the man's life, and John asks how Michael's heart condition was never diagnosed prior to his collapse. Steve responds that many doctors are incentivized by the insurance companies to overlook the signs that may have pointed to Michael's condition, and Dr. Turner confirms it sometimes happens. Law enforcement begins arriving, and the hostage negotiator, Lt. Frank Grimes, makes contact. John agrees to release two hostages, Miriam, who has gone into labor, and Rosa, who has a small infant. In exchange, he gives Frank one hour to add Michael's name to the recipient list. As he prepares to release them, Miriam asks if her husband can stay with her, and another hostage, Mitch, uses the distraction to spray John with mace and stab him in the arm with a scalpel. John loses his gun in the process, but Mitch's girlfriend, Julie, steps over the gun and picks up the can of mace. She sprays Mitch in the face, then kicks him in the groin, as payback for hitting her and breaking her arm. John handcuffs him to the radiator and releases the hostages, including Miriam's husband, who all make it a point to stop and tell the media that John is a good person. 
Police Chief Monroe arrives on scene. Which irritates Frank as he believes Monroe is only there to participate in the media circus and will get in the way. A few of the surveillance feeds are also restored, giving the police a visual on the hostages inside. Frank and Rebecca go to see Denise, who has been sitting by her son's bedside. She says that she feels responsible for what's happening, citing her phone call where she yelled at John to do something to prevent Michael's death. Hoping to recruit her assistance, Rebecca then lies to Denise, telling her that Michael has been placed on the transplant list and that the hospital will perform the surgery pro bono. Meanwhile, Chief Monroe prepares the SWAT team to breach the emergency room, unbeknownst to Frank who then confronts him about it. Frank recommends against the breach, and chastises Monroe for planning things behind his back, but ultimately gets overruled and removed from the case. Monroe then uses Denise to contact her husband. She tells him that Michael has been added to the donor list, still unaware that she was lied to. At the same time, a local news station taps into the phone line and broadcasts the conversation live. As the entire city watches intently, John talks to his son and the SWAT sniper takes aim. Just as he sees himself on the television screen, the sniper fires, hitting John in the arm. He reels from the impact, but recovers quickly, and the sniper falls through the ceiling tile onto the ER floor. John approaches and punches him several times to subdue him, then ties him to a chair as the staff tends to John's wound. Chief Monroe, now responsible for a failed operation, asks Frank to retake the lead on the negotiation. John then emerges from the hospital, using the captured sniper as a shield, as a massive crowd cheers for him. Michael's condition continues to deteriorate, so John offers to trade the SWAT sniper in exchange for his son's transport to the ER. Frank approves the deal, and John tosses out the sniper's assault rifle, before returning to the hospital to wait. Michael arrives at the hospital and Dr. Turner assesses his current condition. Unless he receives a new heart, his death is now imminent. Seeing no other option, John decides to donate his own heart to save his son. They share the same blood type and have already undergone tests to confirm compatibility. One of the hostages, Lester, tries to talk him out of it, but his mind is made up. Following an impassioned plea by John, Dr. Turner says he will do the procedure, and thereby risk his medical license in the process. John handwrites a will, stating his intention to donate his heart to Michael. Lester and Mitch refuse to sign as the required witnesses, but Julie and Max agree. He goes in to say his final goodbyes to Michael, who is barely conscious at this point. John tells him to always do the things you promised to do, because your word is your bond, and it's all you have. He then joins the doctors in a nearby room. John loads the gun with the single bullet he brought, revealing that it had been empty the entire time. He presses the weapon to his temple and pulls the trigger, but it doesn't discharge as the safety is still engaged. As this is happening, the hospital receives a fax. Rebecca, who had reconsidered her position and actually placed Michael on the transplant list, is notified that a compatible heart is available. The BMW driver from the opening scene was an organ donor, and the same blood type as Michael. Denise is notified and frantically tries to contact her husband, but John hears her voice and turns off the radio. She runs to the door, banging on it with the donor list in hand, as the transport helicopter nears the hospital. The emergency room doors are opened, and the hostages walk out, followed by Lester who poses as John to give himself up to the police. John, who stayed behind to observe, is caught by Frank but allowed to watch the surgery before he is arrested. In the coming months, the incident ignites a national debate about healthcare insurance and the related costs. John also stands trial, with the hostages and medical staff there to support. He is acquitted of attempted murder and armed criminal action but found guilty of kidnapping and false imprisonment. The sentence is not immediately issued but his lawyer estimates two years. As John rides away in the police cruiser, Michael tells him, thank you, before giving him one of his signature poses. Okay guys, thank you for watching. Please leave a like on the video and subscribe to see more.